right. You can watch the full documentary on Plus TV Africa's YouTube page. As we explore Ayo's case, we generally take a look at the welfare of the men in uniform. How well are they taken care of? Is our government doing enough for them? And joining us in the studio to discuss this is um, security expert, who himself is an ex-military man, uh, Dixon Osaji. Good Thank to have you this morning. Thank you, Martha. Now, you've watched, I'm sure you've seen part of that documentary, uh, which we did earlier on, on Ayo. And like we said, we're now looking at the welfare of uh, men and women who serve our nation in, you know, in that capacity as military personnel. In your opinion, do you think our government is actually doing enough for them? Well, uh, the case of Ayo is, is a worrisome situation, and uh, I felt sorry for him. And uh, I think for the benefit of those people who don't have military background, I would like to clear mm -hmm. uh, the air on that video uh, because um, I was uh, aware of the situation when it transpired. Uh, my younger brother was in uh, uh, Meduguri by then. I think they were um, asked to go and take over some territory that is uh, Delua, Demboa, and one other locality that is under the hands of Boko Haram. Mm -hmm. And uh, the truth be told, they were not well equipped, and that is just the truth. And uh, uh, the actions of the soldiers, too, was uh, unprofessional as well, because uh, the military has a, a standard uh, operating procedures. For example, in the military, when you cock a gun against a soldier or a mm -hmm. civilian, it is perceived that you've committed murder. And that is why you have no reason for whatsoever to cock a gun. And uh, in the case of Ayo, uh, they, they, they rebelled against a constituted authority, that is uh, Mutini. Mm -hmm. And uh, that rebellion was uh, a punishable offense by death. So, uh, what really went wrong was that I asked a question, and uh, the question uh, instigated uh, some other soldiers, and those soldiers decided to open fire on the air. Now, mm. the truth is whether you fire at the commander or not, or not but the question there is that did you cock your gun? Yes. If you cock your gun, did you fire? Yes. Now, they committed two bloody mistakes because in the military, when you cock your gun without firing, it's a dismissal offense and you could be sentenced to death because it's perceived that you might go out of point and kill the person you've mm. actually cocked your gun for. So cocking your gun against a soldier or a civilian is a death sentence. That is where the discipline is in the military. And that is why you see sometimes most soldiers don't suffer from accidental discharge, you know. Because I used to say that uh, in any given time, you see maybe uh, some is issue happening in our country and you hear it's accidental discharge. Uh, there's nothing like accidental discharge. Any discharge that is coming from a soldier or a police is intentional discharge. Mm. Accidental discharge is only permissible in the war front where your gun is ready. Now, intentional discharge is that you cock your gun, you own the trigger, you, you own the uh, safety catch, and you press the trigger. You can't carry out three process at the same time. You call it accidental discharge. It's an intentional mm -hmm. discharge. So what they did to uh, the commanding officer then, that is the brigade commander, mm -hmm. was very wrong, was condemnable, uh, because uh, they shouldn't have even fired their gun on the air. Because what if uh, there was an accidental discharge and the uh, general was killed in action? Uh, that would be seen a different thing by now. I don't think he would even be alive, because the military would have, with immediate alacrity, taken, take them to a uh, firing squad. Mm -hmm. The military has no uh, uh, tolerance, has zero tolerance to indiscipline when it comes to cocking your gun. But do you think such laws should be reviewed, really? No, it can't be reviewed. If it's reviewed, then there will be uh, a, a lot of uh, indiscipline in the military, and a lot of soldiers will want to cock their gun at any given time against their superior. Mm -hmm. And because uh, uh, the military is a high standard uh, organization, and one of the uh, discipline you have, because the rifle is your hands, mm -hmm. and we class the rifle as our first wife, you know, because that rifle can do and undo. When you take your rifle home, you're not expected to cock your gun at home. Mm -hmm. If you're, you're on duty, you're not supposed to cock your gun when you're not giving order. And that's why we have the uh, a section commander, the platoon commander, we have the officer commanding this platoon, and uh, you're supposed to expect an order before you cock your gun. Except in an enemy given uh, location, then you can put your gun on ready. On ready in the sense that the gun is already cocked and anything could happen. Now, uh, the punishment that was uh, meted upon them, because one thing the military should also understand is that uh, what, what went wrong, you know, if any incident transpired, uh, for us to curtail such incident, not never to transpire again, we need to ascertain what went wrong. What went wrong? Were well, these guys well armed? They were not well armed. They were not well armed. Yeah, and if and you recall, the federal yeah. government had dispensed, uh, disbursed rather, the money for the equipment. And yeah. those equipments were not purchased. Yeah. So it shouldn't have been, in my own judgment, uh, in my own opinion, I'm not a military personnel or expert as you are. I, his question is just
justified. If you ask me to go fight the enemy and you don't equip me, what do you expect? I questions was highly justifiable. Uh, you see, uh, the truth is that the military don't like questions. Uh, when I watched the documentary, I remembered uh, 21 years ago, I think 1999 precisely, uh, we, ha we have a dober. Uh, we were in a firing squad one time, and uh, a major was just using stick and hitting soldiers on their head, hit the target properly, and he was hitting us, and he hit me on my head. I almost turned the rifle against him. I, I, you can't hit me on my head when I'm with my rifle and I'm engaging the enemy in a firing squad, uh, in, in a firing range. And uh, we went to a doba, the same, uh, what, the, uh, you know, when you gather a group of soldiers mm -hmm. to hear their mind and their views, we call it doba. Okay. I think that was where the doba, I, I, I asked that question that uh, resulted to him going to prison. Uh, and I asked a question, after that incident, we left the firing range and we were in the base, and we called for a doba. And I asked my commanding officer, I said, why would this major be doing this thing in the front line? What if he's been shot dead? Mm -hmm. I don't like what he did. Why will he be hitting soldiers on their, on their head? I spent two weeks in detention. For, asking, for that asking that question. asking that question. My commander said, what? Are you saying you're going to kill my major? I said, I don't say I'm not going to kill the major, but I am firing. Don't hit me on my head when I'm firing. I could turn back on you thinking you're my enemy. Please, we should stop that. I was sentenced to two weeks. A prisoner with hard labor in a German army cell. Are you with me? You know, in the, in the barrack, we have a cell. So while I, I was in detention, the commanding officer reviewed my question and he called the major to order and said, hey, what you actually did was wrong. And Dixie was saying something right. I'm going to release him, but because you're an officer, that is why I wanted him to just uh, be detained. I immediately they released me. He called me. He said, uh, I should have rephrased my question. But I said, sir, that is the best way I can put that question. Now, the question I asked triggered his colleagues. And because uh, uh, the truth be told, I can't go and fight my, the enemy without uh, a proper uh, mm -hmm. arms ammunition. When we were in the Bakasi Peninsula War, we were not even well armed then. I guess the, uh, one or two magazines maximum. In fact, I can't even remember, ha remember having two magazines. I only have one magazine. That's a bullet. So ideally, I mean, frankly speaking, it means like we're putting these men out there and endangering their lives. Uh, because if they are not armed, how do you expect them to be able to do anything for the nation? There are people who want them to protect us, but they are not protected. The Nigerian army underrated Boko Haram, mm -hmm. and uh, that was a terrible decision. You understand? Because uh, when the incident uh, started in 2009, the Nigerian police were supposed to go and take over that uh, fight. Uh, when, the, when the fight overpowers the Nigerian police, that's when the Nigerian army is supposed to come on board. Mm. But the Nigerian army were quick to send into that war, thinking they would be able to go and dissipate the enemy. But Boko Haram were prepared, and they took the army by surprise, and they killed a lot of soldiers. The attack uh, I was talking about, that the soldiers died in action. Mm -hmm. That very same year that they were attacked, that, that, that same very year, 2014, that they carried out that mutiny as perceived by the military, mm -hmm. my own younger brother was shot in Damboa. Was shot in Damboa, yeah. No, was shot in Chibok. And why? Because the Boko Haram carried a kind of intensive surveillance, and they knew that most of these soldiers are not armed. OK, for example, we have about, uh, let me say, 30 soldiers. It's, it's 10 soldiers make a section. Three sections of soldiers, 30 soldiers, which make a platoon. About 39 soldiers make a platoon, including an officer. And we have three multipurpose machine guns, one machine gun to a, to a section. And Boko Haram are coming. They're coming like 100 with about 20 to 30 machine guns. You know, machine gun is the general multipurpose machine gun that fires rapid. Mm. That is what we call the uh, firepower of any given uh, section of a soldiers. It gives you backings. So these guys come with a lot of machine guns and they overpower soldiers. Where my younger brother was shot, they knew that well, they don't have much machine gun mm -hmm. there. And why they were coming, they came with about 10 machine guns. And if not for the APC, the armor tank, my younger brother would have been history. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So the military must understand that this war is not a discretional war. They are looking at it as a discretional war. Mm. It's a necessary war. A no. necessary war is a war you need to eliminate once and for all. All right, let's talk about the mental well-being of you know men and women uh, in uniform, for instance. Uh, le let's look at Ayo's case, and there are so many others. I mean, uh, speaking to Femi Falono, the senior advocate of Nigeria, who's handling the case, he said about 63 others are still in detention. This same case, you know, Ayo and a few others were just lucky to be released and didn't get death uh, sentence or 10 years as prescribed by law at the time. Uh, people who have gone through these, you know, military uh, men and women who have gone through these, uh, or, or who are still in service, how well uh, taking care, how is their mental health taken care of? Because they go through a lot of psychological issue, a lot of trauma, you know, how, what has been done for them? What, do we have provisions in the system, in the military system, that handles a such situation for them? Well, there are no provisions to that, uh, because uh, the greatest, uh, the, the, the greatest, uh, uh, a factor in the war front is the mind, you know. 
uh, our military needs to uh, look at the mind of every soldier. Uh, no matter the weapons you uh, give the soldiers, no matter the arms and ammunition, no matter uh, the motivations, if the mind is not prepared, the battle cannot be won. You understand? So, uh, if this, this, the, most of the soldiers are going through psychological uh, uh, issues and uh, uh, emotional issues, uh, are not well taken care of because when you go to the barrack, you see a lot of people amputated. Mm -hmm. You see a lot of soldiers, their hands are gone, free of charge. There is no compensation. Because I, 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 I wrote a letter to the Chief of Army Staff and the Chief of Defense Staff last week uh, concerning the uh, promotions and the uh, well being of these soldiers. Because uh, I, I, a soldier called me from uh, uh, Calabar when I was in the military serve in Calabar 245 Battalion, uh, Armored Division, I was in the Armored Division. So a, a soldier called me and was uh, just greeting me and he said, Dixon, how are you? He said, fine. He said, please, can you push for us? I said, what happened? He said, I'm still a last corporal. I said, last corporal? I said, yes. And this guy was my younger, was my younger colleague. He met me in the barrack. He joined the Army in 1999. Mm. And there's somebody who joined the Army in 1999, 21 years in service, is still a last corporal. A last corporal is a V-shape of a rank in the shoulder, mm -hmm. you know, in the police, the police start from constable to copra, right. while in the army they start from last copra before copra. Oh, now wow. it had just only one stripe on his shoulder. Now there was a, an officer that was in that barrack, I think the officer also met me on ground, he came as a lieutenant. The officer was transferred out of the barrack. 20 years later, the officer came as the commanding officer mm. of this base. Why this soldier remains a last copra? Which is to say that the military hierarchy, uh, the rank and file of the military is abused. It's only the officers that uh, uh, enjoy the privilege of this, uh, of the, of this soldiering. Mm -hmm. Because uh, our soldiers are suffering from promotion. They are suffering from emotional and psychological well-being. Because you can't keep a man for the past. Democracy is 21 years old. How many leaders have come and gone? There's somebody who is serving this country for the past 20 years without any crime, without any offenses, still remain at the same rank. Mm -hmm. That is not well to do. So what our military needs to do is to ensure that they've put in strategies in place. Uh, because uh, we are not taking accountability. That is why our military begins to uh, behave the way they are behaving. Mm -hmm. uh, some few years ago, uh, when the United Kingdom troops went to Iraq to carry out an execution plan, and there was a mechanical error. Are you with me? Yeah. And that mechanical error led to the death of one or two soldiers. Now, the family of those soldiers were not happy. And the Supreme Court uh, held a judgment uh, in respect of those soldiers and uh, passed uh, uh, vad uh, vad uh, verdicts. Mm -hmm. And uh, the soldiers were compensated with about 250,000 pounds. Why? Because the, it was a mechanical error from the military. Mm -hmm. Now, our soldiers, the family of our soldiers, I have said it time and again, and I've sent a note out there to them, they should begin to sue the military of defense. If a soldier died in the front line due to mechanical error from the army, mm -hmm. the, military of the Ministry of Defense should be sued. The army authorities should be sued. The Air Force authorities should be sued. The naval authorities should be sued. Until we begin to sue these guys, they will not uh, take it into consideration that they have an account to now, protect the soldiers. All right, talking about suing, let's, again, uh, this will be final. Uh, on IOS case, when he was acquitted, the note of acquittal from the Supreme Court said, you know, that he is supposed to get all his benefits, you know, all the areas, whatever was due him, he was supposed to get it. Up until today, as we speak, he's not gotten that. Are there chances that the military is going to respond and give him yeah, his benefits? Yeah, they will respond. The military is an, How long the, is this supposed the, to take? The military is a disciplined organization. That's, I won't take that from that. And they respect uh, constituted authority. If there's an order from Supreme Court, I assure you the military is going to respond, but bureaucratically, it might take some time, maybe one year, two years six months because it's going to pass through process you know they're really going to confirm from the base is it truly a soldier what went wrong was it dismissed they will revisit the case and see what happened and before you know they will release it. they will they're they going to pay him and possibly might rejab him back to the to service i don't know what the judgment is from the supreme court is it to recall him back to service or to compensate him and mm -hmm. let him compensate go him. so whatever the case the military will respond to that verdict thank you so very much Osaji, for thank giving you. insight to this matter uh, at that level